this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to the 52nd recording of Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me, Jörg, from Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth, in the reading and discussion of the most wonderful book from Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusions. 52nd reading already and we are in section 3 of the book and the upcoming section 4 is the most important part, but there is to be told something right before we go into it. I don't do that right now. I can only tell you there are already videos in the playlist that deal with that subject. You need to re-watch them again if you didn't watch them, because you always should watch a playlist from the very first to the very last video. That at least is my understanding of this, to get a full understanding of the things that are said. And the very first videos deal already with this new section that is called the Israel deception exploded and from that part in the book on Tom and I will probably take another approach. You will see that, you will hear that, but today in the 52nd reading we are still dealing with that virus as Steve Wahlberg called it in his book and we are going to continue that and as I said we, that is me and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update who is right here connected with me via Skype and I want to Warmly welcome, Brother Tom Fress, all over the ocean to the freezing Belgium. We only have some 50 degrees today. It's really cold outside here. Hello, Tom. Oh, How are you doing? I'm sorry for the cold weather. Gee whiz. <laughs> and and uh, what the, the, the heathen just celebrated their, their uh, solar solstice, which means it's the first day of summer. The longest and, day, uh, yeah, the 21st. Yeah, the yeah. longest day of the year. It should be the warmest day of the year, too. I, I, According to the heathen, uh, <laughs> don't don't make my comments out to be that, that I observe the solar solstice or any other such thing. But I uh, just making conversation. <laughs> well, you can't you can't live me. in this world and leave that unnoticed, Tom. It doesn't mean oh, that yeah. we believe in it, but we have to notice it that takes place. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. 
anyway, uh, my condolences for the cold weather, but uh, <laughs> uh, we we're, we're going to get plenty of cold weather in a few more months. So yeah. And absolutely. anyway, uh, thanks for having me, Yerk. It's my pleasure, privilege, and blessing to be here and uh, and uh, to help the listeners comprehend Steve Wolberg's book and uh, most of all that we return to the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy, the only true and correct school of interpretation of the prophets of God. Bible prophecy is the foretelling of history. The prophets have told us history in advance, and we have proven through this book that history indeed does record the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and particularly the 70th week of Daniel. And uh, that is the most critical uh, thing that's missing from Christianity today. The, the knowledge that the 70th week of Daniel was literally Christ's ministry on the earth, a seven-year period of time that is documented in the most accurate, divinely inspired, infallible record of history, the Bible. And uh, we can take, we can say with the greatest of assurance and the greatest of authority that the 70th week of Daniel is over. Every jot and every tittle was fulfilled by Jesus between his baptism and the going forth of the gospel to the Gentiles seven years later. It's all fulfilled, and the fulfilling of it is the New Testament. That's the record of it. And, and uh, when you read it for yourself in that context, you will come to the only conclusion uh, av available, that the New Testament was written to confirm that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Messiah, just the way Daniel prophesied it. And now, the only, the only thing remaining in our understanding is to understand and accept the fact, as hideous as it is, that the future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel and everything attached to it that we've been taught in the churches for 200 years is all a lie. Every bit of it. And all of those lies bring us to one conclusion. That the purpose of the lie is to, pr is to lead us to accept a First, a false Antichrist, because the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. So a future fulfillment is to give us a false Antichrist. And the result of that is to give us a false Messiah. I hope the listeners can wrap their brain about that. It's, it's, it's just that simple. A future 70th week of Daniel is to get the whole world to accept a false messiah. But in order for that to do, to, to be done, there has to first be a false antichrist. Okay, back to you, Yerk. I didn't mean to, you know, I just want people to know the motive behind Steve Wolberg's book is to teach this fact. That's why Steve Wolberg wrote, wrote this book to expose the futurist delusion and and what it is it, it, what it, what its purpose is and, and this lie of futurism is told for a very uh, purposeful purpose if you'll pardon me to deceive the whole world and uh, the consequences of futurism are just as great as the consequences of Adam and Eve believing the lie of Satan. You shall not surely die. At that point, we became his vassals. Now, those of us who are sons and daughters of Christ, 
who are now believing in a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel have in fact denied the Christ that bought them because it was he that fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. If we say it's future, we deny Christ and we deny his salvation. You can't have it both ways. You can't claim Jesus as Messiah and say the, the, the 70th week of Daniel is future. You've contradicted yourself. So which is it? Is Jesus your Messiah or are you waiting for a future one? You see how easily we've been deceived? Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I think the point that you are making with these introductions uh, every week is uh, very important to remind the people what uh, this is all about. Because this whole uh, reading of the book from Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusion, is to really um, put futurism to the proof. That's right. What, what does hold up of futurism in the light of the Bible. That actually is the game, or is, 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 is not the game, is, is the goal of his whole book writing. And you and I, we are just adding with comments on things that he didn't address that deeply to make the point very, very sure that eventually there's only one book we all should trust in. And that is the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. The right. uncorrupted, the uncorrupted, still valid, infallible word of God. Yeah, not the Pope is infallible, but the word of God is infallible, and we should always remember that. And with every teaching of man, we should be very, very careful. People should also be very, very careful with what we teach. It is always to hold these teachings against the light of truth and the light of truth is the Bible and if what we say holds up against the Bible then it's good and if it doesn't hold up we'd like to hear it also send us your comments it is not that Tom and I pose here as teachers of the world but we want everybody to understand the truth as it should be understood by only reading and studying the truth without the quote-unquote church glasses, as Tom called it already in the past. We have to take off these church glasses. And let me assure you one thing, Tom and I, we are both also, or we have also been, and we still are partially betrayed because we put on church glasses. Tom has been churched all his life for the last, I don't know, about 50 years or something. And I, when I came into my studies, also couldn't help to watch videos of other quote-unquote pastors, of other quote-unquote teachers, and I gobbled up their teaching as candy. It sounded, it, it was sweet on the lips, but the more candy you eat, the more it gives you a bad feeling in your stomach. And now Tom and I are returning to real, true Bible study, just the Bible and the Bible alone, without any other man in the world telling us what these things mean. And all of a sudden we gain a different understanding in key points of the Bible, especially the book of Revelation. And with what we experience with the Holy Spirit leading us into all truth by reading the Bible, not by having a conversation with the Holy Spirit. I didn't invite Jesus for coffee this morning, you know. But we take out our Bible and we read verse after verse, precept after precept, and check it out and understand it the way it is written. And not, as the Bible warns before, not one thing of the prophecies of this book is written for private interpretation. And that's what you get when you listen to Bible teachers, Bible scholars. And that's why it is so important that Tom and I really adhere to the Bible and just share that with you and ask you, dear listener, dear viewer, whenever you hear or see something that you can point the Bible at is not what we have said, what we have said is not according to the Bible, then 
please point us to it. You know, that's what brothers do, right? They help each other. They want to edify each other. It's not educating. Educating is a Jesuitical system. In the Bible, we are called to edify one another. Tom edifies me, I edify Tom, and you edify us. And as we as edifying you over the videos. And that's exactly what Steve Wolberg also tried to do with writing his book. Now, let alone that he's a Seventh-day Adventist. Let alone that he is a Jew. Just take the preaching that he takes out from the Bible, puts into his own words, because sometimes when a man writes these things, they are easier for many people to understand. That's why people write books. That, I think, was the motivation for Steve Wolberg to write that book. And that surely is the motivation for Tom and me to read and discuss this book on camera, so you can also profit from those studies. But in the first place, always put the Bible and hold everything against the Bible. Everything Steve Wolberg says, every, in his book, everything Tom Frest says, and everything Jörg Lissmann says. Everything. It must be seen clearly as truth in the light of the Bible. And if it doesn't hold up, then we need to hear it from you too. We invite honest biblical criticism. You know, you can keep comments away that are insulting from, of people who have no idea what the Bible is all about, who are scoffers, who are deniers of the truth. We, we don't care for that. You can write your comments, okay, maybe we even let them stand on the video, but we don't care for that. We all want to advance our curve of being edified by the scripture. And that's the goal why we have been doing the last 51 readings of this book and 58 videos in this total playlist. And that's why we are going to continue too. Now, I need to have Tom have a comment on what I just said because I know that he has something to complete my words with. Well, I concur 100%. Uh, but uh, all of this is the understanding that all of the lies that we've believed have come from people who pretend to be friends of Christ. They say Jesus is the Messiah. Well, that's, that's, that's Christianity. But they also say the 70th week of Daniel is future. And that denies that Jesus was the, was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Therefore, Jesus was not the Messiah. So, so we, don't, we don't trust every spirit. We don't believe every spirit. We don't believe men. And we rely, and we have to rely 100% upon the scriptures. And if we need an answer to a question, we must find that answer in the scriptures. And I think Steve Wolberg understands this. Certainly, I have learned the hard way not to listen to every wind of teaching. And uh, most are motivated by uh, a, a spirit of deception. And uh, it's, it's, it's not safe ever to trust a man. Never is it safe to trust a man. It's not safe to trust every spirit. It's not even safe to trust the angels unless what they say passes the test of Scripture. That is the infallible teaching of Almighty God. And uh, there's more to being a Berean than just saying you're a Berean. That means you search the Scriptures daily to prove all things. And uh, the Protestant Reformers, though they were not true to their word, they said the scripture and the scripture alone. Well, we mean business. It, it was true that the Protestant reformers didn't maintain their belief in the scriptures and the scriptures alone. But we're going to correct that mistake. And we're going to believe the scriptures and the scriptures alone. And now you know why the Jesuits work so hard to pollute the Word of God. All these other Bible translations are designed to water down the truth. 
to make us doubtful about the word of God. The authorized King James Version of the Bible is unmolested. And uh, we ought to all have a copy of it. We ought to make that our standard and, uh, and, and resist all outward impositions. No more phony Bibles. Okay, we could go on and on. I know we want to get to the book, and the listeners are wait, anxiously waiting to continue. Yeah. But uh, the, uh, good instruction. The Bible alone. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. So let's go into the study of the book for tonight. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of what I have read already. means a little bit of repetition, just to get back into the understanding of what we are reading. So I will start here uh, with uh, the Path of the Virus chapter, as it is still called, concerning the highly probable link to Margaret MacDonald, the author MacPherson, who we spoke uh, earlier about, who wrote this uh, book, uh, which is called, oh, I, I don't know anymore, um, The Incredible Cover-Up, huh? I think that was his book. Um, he says in his book, Since Margaret MacDonald was the first person to teach a coming of Christ that would precede the days of Antichrist, it necessarily follows that Darby, back to whom pre-tribism can easily be traced, was at least the second or third or even farther down the line. To date, no solid evidence has been found that proves that anyone other and this young Scottish lassie was the first person to teach a future coming of Christ before the days of Antichrist. Before 1830, Christians had always believed in a single future coming, that the catching up of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 will take place at the glorious coming of the Son of Man when he shall send his angels to gather together all of his elect. Whether she realized it or not, Margaret did her part to pave the way for the doctrine that would demand separate waiting rooms at the end of this age, one for the Church and another one for Israel. Finally, to charge that Darby could never have been influenced by Margaret's pre-Antichrist rapture with the knowledge of her revelation and his whereabouts in 1830 now out in the open, is practically the same as saying that a man found with a smoking revolver in hand and standing over a freshly killed victim in the middle of a lonely desert could not possibly be the suspect. In light of MacPherson's careful research, it seems, Margaret MacDonald's pre-Antichrist quote-unquote rapture revelation is the real smoking gun behind Darby's theology. Regardless, the essential pre tribulationism of Margaret's doctrine soon became a weapon of mass deception in the hands of Darby and his dispensationalist followers. Okay, can, can I stop and make a comment Of here? course you can do that, Tom, please. Okay, okay. Th before we get too far, I, I don't know, I'm not reading ahead, so I don't know how far uh, uh, Wahlberg is going to take us, but I need to get this point made. Certainly, I can guarantee you that there are numbers of listeners right now who are wanting us to explain thoroughly why there is no rapture, okay? Why there is no uh, coming of Christ to uh, take the church out of this world before the Antichrist is revealed. That's what the Baptists and all the, all the denominations consider to be the, the great hope, the blessed hope, is that the church will be raptured out of the world before the Antichrist is revealed. And everybody ought to know that is a direct contradiction of Scripture. Now, I don't have the passage right in front of me, but everybody knows this passage. Everybody's read it. Everybody knows it's in the Bible. Most good Bereans, most good Bible-believing Christians can just turn the Bible open to the page where this passage is written. It, Paul was warning people, 
that not to believe those like Hymenaeus and Philetus who said that Christ had already returned and that they were all quote unquote left behind. Okay? There was a big lie going around at the time of Paul when he was ministering that Christ had already returned in the spirit. Okay? That Christ was already returned. And Paul corrected them. He set the record straight. Christ will not return until that man of sin is revealed. What does that mean? That the Antichrist precedes the return of Christ. Antichrist will be revealed before Christ returns. Margaret MacDonald preached that Christ would return before the Antichrist. Now, everybody's familiar with what Margaret MacDonald taught because it's taught in all the churches without exception that I'm aware of. How can we allow that teaching to continue in our churches when it's clearly contradiction, a clear contradiction of the Scripture? Paul set the record straight. He put the liars on the block. He told people that Christ had not yet returned and would not return and could not return until before the man of sin was revealed. The man of sin must first come. Okay? And Paul also went to great lengths to, uh, to witness to the Thessalonians that he'd already told them about this coming Antichrist. He named him. He said, whoever succeeds, he who now letteth. Okay, that was the Roman government, the ones who crucified Christ. These Caesars, the government of Rome, was literally restraining the rise of this man of sin. This man of sin, this Antichrist, could not ascend to power until the Roman government had been removed. And it was going to be removed. And Paul was very careful when he wrote to the Thessalonians not to be too explicit in his writing perchance that it would fall into the hands of the Roman government and the Thessalonians would be destroyed and all of Christianity would be put in jeopardy because they plainly knew they were infallibly taught by their apostles that the Roman government was going to fail. It was going to be destroyed. It was going to be literally taken out of the way. Okay? Anybody preaching this in the, it, to the ear of the Roman government would have been held uh, uh, by, under charges of sedition, traitors. That's why Paul eventually lost his head. Okay? He spared the Thessalonians. He was very careful in what he wrote in his letter, but he said this, don't you remember when I was with you in your presence, I told you these things? Why did Paul have to be so careful? Because the, the, he who now letteth, that who was in power at that time, had the power to destroy Paul, had the power to destroy the Thessalonians, had the power to destroy the church. So he was extra careful in his discussion with the Thessalonians. But he said, don't you remember when I was with you in your presence, when we had confidentiality? I told you. I want you to remember who I told you. It's that man of sin will re be revealed as soon as the Caesars are taken out of the way. The Roman government is going to be removed, and there will be another Roman government under another name, and it will be centered in Rome. Now, we know that today as the papacy. Okay? This shouldn't be surprising to anybody because 500 years ago, all of us Bible believers knew this. Okay? 
But over the last 200 years, we've been contaminated with this cockamamie antichrist doctrine called futurism that says that the antichrist won't be revealed until be after Christ returns. Margaret MacDonald, who was given to ecstatic utterances. She, you might call her the first charismatic, the first tongue speaker. Okay? Error! Error! Can you spell error? That's what it is. Error. Morning, noon, and night. It's error. You don't get revelation directly by the Holy Spirit. You get it from the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit confirmed it to you by showing you scripture after scripture after scripture that prove. Okay? It's like Yerk said at the beginning, I didn't invite Christ to have coffee with me this morning. I didn't invite the Holy Spirit to come and have breakfast with me this morning so we could discuss future and history. The Holy Spirit will never contradict the scriptures. The Holy Spirit will not add to the word of God, nor will he take anything away from the word of God. So, how is it that so many people think that they're hearing the truth by direct revelation, brand new truths coming into the body of Christ by this spirit-filled so-and-so? It's all error. Every bit of it lock, stock, and barrel. It's all error. It's designed to deceive us. And Margaret MacDonald, no matter how... Uh, 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 What's the word I want to use? No matter how well-meaning Margaret MacDonald thought she was, she was teaching futurism. She was teaching something that is directly contradictory to the Scripture, which plainly says Christ will not return until that man of sin is revealed. But every Christian, every Protestant, in name only, every evangelical says the Antichrist will be revealed, or, or Christ will come first, and then that man of sin will be revealed. It's all a lie. It's an obvious lie. Anybody, anybody that, that knows the scriptures can slam dunk this idea that Christ comes before the man of sin. So what's it going to take? Are we going to continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, Tom, Christ came before the man of sin, but the first time, it's not about the second time. No, we're talking <laughs> about the second yeah, time. Yeah, that's, I hope I haven't confused anybody. No, no, but that's the point that I, I just want to make. It is correct to say Jesus Christ comes first and then Antichrist comes. No, but we're that's talking about the about first the coming. coming. That's about the fulfillment of the 70th yes. week. And that's Lord, why, have mercy. that's why they distort... Daniel's 70th week and replace the he, which is the prince, Jesus Christ, with the he, the future Antichrist. That's what invites them to make this error to the people. They deny that Jesus is the Christ. How can you deny that Jesus is the Christ when you say Jesus Christ hasn't come in the very first place? So before Jesus Christ comes, the Antichrist comes first. Yeah. It, it's it's always 180 degrees around what Bible teaches. The Bible teaches yeah. first comes Christ, then comes Antichrist. And in the end times, Antichrist is already revealed, as Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we just put in the text here for everybody to see. And then Jesus Christ comes back. Yeah, we're talking about the second coming of Christ. Yeah. Okay. Antichrist must first be revealed before Christ can return. And that's exactly the way it happened in history. I mean, that's, what, that's the one thing that lends the most credibility to what we are telling the listeners. History has unfolded exactly the way Paul prophesied it. The Antichrist was long ago revealed. He has persecuted the saints. He's drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. He has reigned over the kings of the earth. He controls the governments of the world even today. It's all fulfillment of Bible prophecy, just the way it's written. 
just the way it's written, not the way it's taught in the churches, the way it's written. That's why it's so important not to listen to a man. If a man's mouth is moving, he's lying. Okay? We're sinners. You want, you want something trustworthy, you have to find first an unadulterated Bible and then read it and read it just exactly the way it's written. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away from it. And then believe what it says. And if the Bible prophesies something, keep that prophecy in your heart and wait to see its fulfillment in history. And then all the liars are clearly exposed, just like Margaret MacDonald and this whole cockamamie rapture theory. It's not a theory, it's an abomination. Let me just call it what it is. It's designed to deceive the very elect, and has it not? It certainly has. And you're going to, you're going to, have to tell, tell people who are going to tell you, oh, the elect can't be deceived. Aren't they proud? Aren't they proud? And they're all clearly deceived. And they know it deep down in their heart. They know what the scripture says. Christ cannot come before the man of sin is revealed. They know that's what the scripture says, yet still they'll tell you the rapture. The secret rapture, Christ comes before the man of sin is revealed, before the Antichrist is revealed. They're liars, right? They're, they're, they're obvious liars. Look, when you walk into the kitchen after telling your son, I'm going to the post office, when I come back, you better not be in the cookie jar. Stay out of the cookie jar. The mom comes home from the post office. The kid's got chocolate chips all over his face. Son, did you get in the cookie jar like I told you not to? No, mom, I didn't get in the cookie jar. Got chocolate chips all over his face. He's a liar. Okay? That's exactly how it appears when you accept and believe the truth. All the pastors in this country have chocolate chips on their faces. It's childish. It's ridiculous. It ought to be called out on. Don't let this go another day. Don't let this lie be perpetrated another day. How can you be a help to your friends and your family? How can you rescue your beloved pastor from this lie if you sit in the pews and keep your mouth shut? We all have a responsibility. We all have a God-given responsibility. And if you're waiting for somebody to command you, like a general, you'll be waiting a long time. Sometimes we just have to pull up our bootstraps and do our job. And that is to correct the, fa the, the errors in the church. Futurism, hook, line, and sinker, it's all a lie. And it has to be routed out of the church if the church is to have any power in this world at all. We cannot believe this lie and seek to serve Christ. It'll come to no avail. We are all made subjects of the Antichrist of Rome because we fail to extirpate and annihilate this Roman Catholic teaching from the Protestant churches. Now let us be about our business. Back to you, York. Yeah, thank you very much for your comment there, Tom. As always, very much appreciated. So we're going to continue in the book when it says, Dispensationalism is the theory that God deals with mankind in distinct periods or ages. According to Darby, and uh, I think I have a picture prepared here of Darby, John Nelson, and I just wanna, oh, no, this is Schofield, sorry. <laughs> uh, sometimes too many pictures, I don't know, have, do I have Darby? No, I don't have Darby yet, uh, again. Anyway, um, according to Darby, we're now in the quote-unquote church age, which will conclude with the rapture. Then, Daniel's 70th week will supposedly kick in, during which the Antichrist will attack unfortunate Jews. Thus, in spite of the positive features of his ministry, Darby followed Irving 
and probably Margaret. He also followed John Henry Newman. He followed Todd, Burke, Maitland and Ribera by inserting the virus of futurism into his theology, now a pre-tribulation rapture theology. Yeah? That's futurism all about. A pre-tribulation rapture theology and, of course, a seven-year tribulation. This created a link between John Nelson Darby, the father of modern dispensationalism, and Francisco Ribera, the ancient Jesuit father of futurism. Darby visited America six times from 1859 to 1874, preaching in all its major cities. Now, the dates between 1859 and 1874, do you know what just comes into my mind, Tom? In that time, in the 1860s, you had the quote-unquote civil war. Yeah. Aren't events like war often used to distract people from other important things that take, back, that take place in the background? Certainly. So that when, and also prepare people to believe quote-unquote Christian lies because in, the, in a state of war, in a state of extreme uh, 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 threat and, and, and uh, anxiety, people turn to Scripture. And, and, and what the better time to get somebody like Darby to come and feed the desire for scriptural or biblical or Christian knowledge? Okay, it all works together. I, I, I hope I've helped you with that. Yeah, and to do that in the time of the preparation of the war, during the war time, and after That's the right. war time. That's exactly right. Just when people despair and are in need of spiritual guidance, this devil comes to America six times. I don't think there's an incident that he comes six times between 1859 and 1874 preaching in all its major cities. As American Protestants clicked open and received his sermons, they had no idea the virus was sneaking in. But that's exactly what happened. Tragically, the historicism their forefathers were burned for was being systematically dragged toward the recycle bin, a computer term for the trash can. Now, can I expand the listener's understanding of what dispensationalism is really all about? Sure. Okay. I, do, I don't mean to gainsay the author. I'm only adding uh, uh, information uh, to make dispensationalism and what it is really understandable by the listeners. Okay. First of all, you got to realize that dispensationalism the ultimate purpose and goal of dispensationalism is to make the quote-unquote Christian world believe that God has another means of salvation for the Jew than for the Gentile. Okay? We're all taught in the churches, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, that's not going to entice a Jew, is it? Not unless God grants him repentance, of course. So, to, to uh, include the Jews in this heavenly kingdom of Christ, there has to be another, a different form of salvation. Now, what, pray tell, would Satan most want the Jews to do to assure that they could not be included in the kingdom of Christ to return to animal sacrifices just like they did before 70 AD when God used the Roman 10th legion to destroy that temple and leave not one stone of it remaining upon another okay Bible plainly tells us no sin is remitted by the blood of animals okay only the blood of Christ can take away sin. So dispensationalism gives us the 
the uh, the inkling or the understanding that God is going to save the Gentiles by the means of the blood of Christ, and he's going to save the Jews by the blood of lambs and goats. That is the whole purpose of dispensationalism. Now, I'm not going to deny that God uses different ways at different times to bring forth the gospel, to teach us incrementally the truth. Okay? It's a progression. But to use that thing and give it a name like dispensationalism and use it to deceive God's people is in, unconscionable. And it is a product of the Roman Catholic Church. It is a fabrication of the theologians of the Church of Antichrist. This cockamamie idea of dispensationalism that says that God is a respecter of persons. That God brings one mean of salvation for the Gentile Christian and another means of salvation to the Jew. One is the blood of Christ that saves. The other is the blood of animals that save. And, and most churches today teach dispensationalism. Why? Because it goes right along with futurism. It supports futurism. It is a fundamental, foundational teaching of futurism. It is lock, stock, and barrel, part of the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. Because even Adam and Eve were not saved, but for the blood of the Lamb of God. Christ. And they looked forward to the day when their lamb would literally be slain on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem by making animal sacrifices. Every time they made an animal sacrifice, they were pointing forward to Christ. And it was accounted unto them for righteousness, wasn't it? Just like Abraham, who believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. But anybody back in Adam and Eve's day, or any time after that, who thought the blood of lambs and goats was going to save them, they died in their sins. Okay? Now, we likewise, in our generation, we look back to Christ. But we don't make sacrifices because his sacrifice has been made for the whole world to see. Now, if we don't make sacrifices in commemoration of the sacrifice that Jesus made, then Roman Catholicism is a lie because that's what the Mass is. It's a recreation, a reenactment of the literal crucifixion of Christ on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. They call it a sacrifice. And the Bible plainly tells us Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. How did he do that? By becoming the sacrifice himself. The, once, the one time all sufficient sacrifice for sin for all men for all time. Now, once that sacrifice has been made, the only one that has the power to take away sin, then what in the world is the use of animal sacrifices but to reject the sacrifice that Jesus made? That's what dispensationalism is. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. I'm sorry for the interruption there. You probably can't hear me, but, but look... Dispensationalism is designed to guarantee the destruction of every Jew. Do you comprehend what I'm telling you? Roman Catholicism preaches replacement theology, that they have replaced the Jew, and therefore the Jews are damned. For killing Christ, the Jews are damned. And the Roman Catholic Church now is the new chosen people. That's Roman Catholic canon law. That's, that's Roman Catholicism. That'll explain dispensationalism. Why all of a sudden we believe that God has a different means of salvation for the Jew. Look, the Vatican has said it's not necessary anymore for Christians to, to, uh, for Christians to uh, uh, proselytize the Jew. Christians don't have any obligation to evangelize the Jew. Let the Jew be a Jew. Why? 
so they can eat and drink damnation to themselves. Just like the Catholics do, who make a, a, a sacrifice, bloodless though it may be, they admit, they demand that it is a sacrifice. When the Bible plainly says Jesus caused all sacrifices and oblations to cease, the Roman Catholic Church wants the Jews to die the death of Roman Catholicism by putting all their hope, faith, and trust in another sacrifice. One, a bloody sacrifice of animals that cannot take away sin. We've got that in black and white in the Bible. And then also the Roman Catholic sacrifice, bloodless as it is. It has no power to take away sin. It is a sacrifice that is forbidden by the Scripture because the Scripture plainly says, He shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease in Daniel's prophecy. Now do you have a better understanding what dispensationalism is? Dispensationalism is part and parcel of futurism. And it's taught in all the churches, almost without exception. Are you beginning to believe me that the worst place for a Bible-believing Christian to be is in the churches? Do you believe me when I tell you when Satan has an opportunity that he will occupy the space behind the pulpit of every church and seek to preach in the Protestant churches and teach in the Protestant churches to deceive God's people, even the very elect of God? Because that's exactly what it is today. And dispensationalism is proof of that fact. Futurism is proof. Proof of that fact, we've got Roman Catholic liars behind the pulpits of our churches. And I defy anyone who's listening to the sound of my voice to prove me wrong. The churches are no place for God's people. Damnable lies are taught in the churches. Satan is transformed into an angel of light, and even his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. And where do they reside? Behind the pulpits of our churches. And you'll have your hands cut, your your work cut out for you to try to remove one from behind the pulpits. So the best thing to do is just get out. Just get out and find a real Bible-believing Christian to teach you. Or better yet, get an authorized King James 1611 Bible and trust the Holy Spirit to teach you. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom, for that wonderful explanation you just gave, I hope. I supported that a little bit with the pictures I chose to put in here. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to go uh, a little bit further towards the end of this chapter when the author says one of the most important figures of, in this whole drama is Cyrus Ingerson Schofield, who you can see in the picture right here. He lived between 1843 and 1921. He was a Kansas lawyer who was great, greatly influenced by the writings of Darby. In 1909, Schofield published the first edition of his famous Schofield Reference Bible. In the early 1900s, this Bible became so popular in American Protestant Bible schools that literally millions of copies were printed. What made Schofield's Bible so energizing was not so much the scripture itself, but his footnotes. The writing of man versus the writing of God. The man leading you into understanding the Bible instead of the Holy Spirit leading you of understanding the Bible. That's the point that um, Steve Wahlberg makes here. 
What made Schofield's Bible so energizing was not so much scripture itself. That was a 1611 King James Bible, even though it was the corrupted 1769 Blaney version. But it's the footnotes. It's his understanding that people garbled up like sugar candy. Yet those footnotes are just the part that contained the virus. Anti-Reformation interpretations were inserted that pointed the finger away from Papal Rome and toward the future Antichrist. As 20th century American Protestants downloaded Schofield's notes into their unsuspecting brains, the virus attacked file after file linked to historicism, clicking delete. The Moody Bible Institute and the Dallas Theological Seminary have strongly supported the teachings of John Nelson Darby. Thus, these firmly Christian institutions, in spite of, and Christian actually I think we should put here in uh, quotation marks, <laughs> in spite of the good they have done and continue to do, have unknowingly enabled the virus to do what viruses do best, multiply rapidly. We can continue for another page where it says, Then in the 1970s, Pastor Hal Lindsay, and I also prepared a picture of Hal Lindsay here, that's him, a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, which Tom spoke about, as I remember correctly, a few uh, broadcasts ago, because that is the, uh, I, can, I, I think Tom can make a better point of that, but that's the, uh, the most uh, important seminary um, that is in the United States of America when it goes about uh, educating uh, new uh, pastors and, and priests. Isn't that right, Tom? Yes, that's right. The theological seminaries in this country, the Protestant theological seminaries, the most popular, the most well-known, the most prestigious bib theological seminaries in this country were were corrupted with futurism okay remember it started in 1805 1810 uh the the tractarian movement began uh, uh uh preaching futurism the idea that the papacy is not the antichrist the, the antichrist is a single individual that comes just before christ returns that's what was taught in the british protestant theological seminaries and it was brought to this country and installed into the Protestant theological seminaries. You know, you know, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, Moody, you name them. They're all teaching futurism. And guess what? That's where we get our pastors. Okay? Now, I, I, I'm, I'm here to say that, that, uh, that Steve Wolberg is being very charitable to these theological seminaries. I'm not as forgiving or patient with the theological seminaries in this country. Listen, they teach the Bible, don't they? Well, how is it that they can teach futurism? It's a contradiction of the scripture. These institutions of theological learning are disciples of the Jesuits and the counter-reformation of Rome. That's why when you have a Protestant behind the pulpit of your church, he teaches Roman Catholic theology. He teaches futurism. He teaches you that the 70th week of Daniel is future. It has never been fulfilled in history, and therefore, Jesus is not the Christ. He'll tell you out of one side of his mouth that Jesus is the Christ. He'll turn right around and deny it by telling you the 70th week of Daniel's future. And guess where he learned it? From the Dallas Theological Seminary. From Moody Bible Institute and every other famous Bible theology seminary and college in this country. Listen, when the Jesuits set out to go to war, they mean business. 
They cover every base. They leave no refuge. They leave no space for escape. And now we've got in our churches Jesuit theologians who are dead set to destroy Protestantism lock, stock, and barrel. And what is Protestantism? Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. The historical papacy, who has ruled and reigned over God's inheritance for 15, 1,800 years, persecuted the saints. How could we believe such lies? How could we believe that the Antichrist is future, when the Bible plainly says Christ will not return until that man of sin is revealed. That should be the teaching of the Dallas Theological Seminary and Moody Bible Institute and all the other quote-unquote Christian theology universities. But that's not what they teach. And they send us out hordes of Jesuit dupes. You can't find a Protestant pastor anywhere in this country. Because there's not a one of them that will tell you. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. The 70th week of Daniel began at, Jew at Jesus' baptism and ended at the stoning of Stephen. It happened 2,000 years ago, just like the Bible prophesies, just like history reveals in the New Testament, the most infallible record of history we have. But you've got a whole nation of so-called Protestant theological seminaries that teach lies morning, noon, and night crank out Jesuit pastors and priesters all over this country until the fact that you can't find the truth. You can't find the truth in this country. And you wonder why it seems like your prayers bounce off the ceiling? They can't even make it through the sheetrock on the ceiling. We believe lies. We made our bed with the whore of Rome. We call it a Christian church. God have mercy. You going to blame Christ for Roman Catholicism? Because that's who gets the blame if you call Roman Catholicism a Christian church. And who taught you to do that? Your Dallas theological seminarians who say, the papacy's not the Antichrist. It's a single individual. I hadn't even come yet. And besides that, we're all going to be raptured out because Jesus is going to come first, take us out, and then the man of sin will be revealed. Oh, why don't you get a Bible and read it, and you'll know that every D Dallas theological seminarian is a liar. Every Moody Bible Institute pastor is a liar. Every single one of them, without exception. And you can prove it. You can certainly prove it with far more proofs than he can prove his stupid futurist nonsense. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I was just looking for a picture of a devil behind the pulpit that is a little bit more revealing than the one that I put in there because this is the cover of the book. And um, I find it, I, I find it very difficult. <laughs> I don't find the book right now, uh, that the picture right now. Okay, but but thank you very much, Tom. That was very uh, interesting what you had to say. And we are continuing with Pastor Hal Lindsay, and we are going to speak a little bit about a book he wrote, a book that almost everybody knows. Then in the 1970s, this Pastor Hal Lindsay, graduate of DTS, which is the short form for Dallas Theological Seminary, released his blockbuster book, The Late Great Planet Earth, as you can see here in your picture. This 177-page, easy-to-read volume brought futurism to the masses of American Christianity and beyond. 
The New York Times labeled it, quote, the number one bestseller of the decade, unquote. Over 30 million copies have been sold and it has been translated into over 30 languages. Through the late great planet Earth, the Jesuit virus of futurism made incredible progress in its ancient intelligence strategy to replace historicism as the prophetic operating system of the protestant world. Historicism is the prophetic operating system of the protestant world. I think Tom this is a nice sentence to round it up for today. We have already uh, gone a little yes, over an hour absolutely. and we will probably finish this wonderful chapter then next time when it goes into enter left behind so we can make a little break here and go into left behind then next time and finish on this wonderful sentence that uh, Steve Wahlberg writes here historicism is the prophetic operating system of the protestant world we have two pillars where protestants stand on one is Jesus is the Christ and the second is the papacy is the Antichrist. When you deny the one or the other you cannot call yourself a protestant and if you're not a protestant but a self-proclaimed Christian then there's only one possibility over what you are and that is a Roman Catholic. I'm sorry. The truth right. is sometimes hard to bear but that's, that's right. what it is. Whether you adhere to the Bible and you adhere to the teaching that the Bible teaches as the Protestants did and the Protestants all knew 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the years 27 to 33, 34 AD completely and perfectly and Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the salvation of everyone in this world who ever lived, who lives and whoever will live. There is only one salvation given unto man and that is the name Christ Jesus and the papacy is the Antichrist from the first to the now reigning until the very last not the last Antichrist as people often like to say but just the last in a long line of a successive dynasty of Antichrists the one that will rule at the moment when Jesus Christ comes back and he is as Antichrist as is the very first Pope of Rome because the right. papacy is the Antichrist. And now I will give a last and final comment to Brother Tom Press. I don't think I need to comment. That was as good a closing statement as I've ever heard. Thanks, Jerk. I'll see you next week. Yeah, and I see all you next week and we just hope and pray that you open this book read the Bible, the 1611 King James Bible, read it verse by verse and you will see that the Bible is chronologically and what you read in one verse and then comes another verse that is also successive in how it's being revealed. Make sure you read the AV 1611 King James Bible because that's uncorrupted and therefore we pray and we hope to see you next week again. Maranatha. The President de Joya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, both, both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action.
DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, for the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this House. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. Well, let me say this. If the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in his truth. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.